Thanks, Caitlin. That was really, really great. And I'm really pleased to welcome you on to what is going to be an amazing discussion with four senior leaders in the food industry and a young emerging leader that we've just heard from. So amongst all of these women, we span large corporates, academia, investment, not-for-profit, and the startup world. And these women are all making a big impact as they lead the way in reimagining and even reinventing the global food system of the future. My name's Christine Pitt, and I'm the CEO and founder of Food Futures Company. And I'm going to briefly introduce them in a moment. But at first, I wanted to just uh, give you a bit of background. And I think Caitlin's already shared some fairly sobering statistics with us. A 2018 McKinsey report stated that the corporate pipeline in the food industry is leaking. And it's sadly going backwards in, in the representation of women at a C-suite level. In 2017, in the US, there were 23% of C-suite were women, and this has been uh, dropped down to 18% in 2008. 18. And this is despite the fact that gender diversity has been shown to drive better performance in companies, with a 15% above national average when there are females in the C-suite. It helps companies win the war for talent, and it increases innovation and probably really importantly, provides better customer insights. After all, 50% or more of our customers are women. We also see a similar pattern when it comes to the startup world. In 2019, only 2.2% of investor funds went into women-led startups in the US. And in Europe, more than 90% of tech investment still goes to all male teams. And once again, this is despite the research that demonstrates that female-led startups are on par on all key indicators, such as raising follow-on investment and achieving successful IPOs and exits. And while the not-for-profit sector does score a little bit better, with 45% of CEOs being women, on average, they only make 66% of male salaries. So how can we address this clearly nonsensical waste of talent? especially as we head into an unprecedented, unprecedented time of uncertainty and change, where the challenges that we're facing require the very, very best minds to be deployed. I'd like you to reflect on that, and we'll be asking, uh, asking you to contribute to this panel by asking some questions in a little while. So I would like to turn to our panel. Uh, so from left to right, uh, firstly, we have Daniel Nirenberg, who's from the US and is the founder of Food Tank. We then have Angeline, Dr. Angelina Cheria, who's based here in Melbourne and is the Executive Director of Growth and Innovation for Simplot Australia. We have Renska Lind, also from the US, who is CEO of Food System 6 and a general partner at First Course Capital. And Krista Watkins, Managing Director of Natural Evolution, which is in the far north of Queensland. I'm going to let them tell their stories rather than have me introduce them. And you've already met Caitlin, of course. So can I turn to you, Angeline, first, and please tell us a little bit about your journey in the food industry and what, what has helped you to navigate the world of big corporates and also big universities? Hopefully you can hear me, yes. Okay, good afternoon. Thanks, Christine, and so lovely to be on a panel of such esteemed, I would say, young women. How's that, right? You only don't get that, Kate, Caitlin. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my journey has been uh, pretty much I've started in the food industry. I've been in there for 20 years. Six years ago, I went to do something very crazy, which has now uh, become uh, Monash Food Innovation, but effectively a new business model and innovation model to bring sector-led um, innovation and growth together in Australia. So very proud of that. Um, and I guess over the years, um, you know, as a young female, as you come through and working probably also in manufacturing, you certainly um, do get your fair share of what I would call uh, maybe the nudges, um, whether you might be the, the first female around a table or in a factory environment or in a, in a, in a strategic board um, conversation as well. So I guess that starts to also... Um, you know, probably help our one build resilience, but also start to actually um, uh, figure out for you and how you lean into this. And as Christine and I were kind of talking, it's um, 
you know, for me, I've never really seen that. So, you know, I think um, I worked in Japan for five years, right, with Mars. So um, I was a female, but a dark female at that. So you couldn't be any worse in Japan, I'm sorry, <laughs> at that point in time. But also it taught me how to really lean in and be resilient around that, but actually to have those conversations around uh, bringing that in. So for me, it's, it's not necessarily just about the gender balance, but it's diversity as a whole, if you think about it. And that's probably some of the themes I want to explore as we sort of move through. Sure. Thanks, um, Angeline. Red Skirt, can, uh, you've had more than 20 years experience in the food sector and you advocate for a healthy and resilient food system through your work in both the not-for-profit and policy area, arenas, but you're also an investor in your own right. So can you tell us a little bit about how you've managed to knit together these different roles around what is very much a clear purpose that you've shared with me and I'd like you to share, and particularly your mission around building a collaborative environment and a broad community of support and trust-based relationships across the ecosystem. It's a long, a long question, I know, gave you time to think. <laughs> And I'm sure you know how well, to answer. Hopefully we can, we can get to all of that at some point. Yeah. Um, so thank you. Also an honor to be here. And I'm very glad that all of you chose to be here today in this discussion. Um, sure. So uh, as Christine said, I run an accelerator. I'm the co-founder of Food System 6. We are based in the San Francisco Bay Area. And we now have a portfolio of 29 companies. We support both for-profit and non-profit startups. So there's a little bit of a hint towards how I think about where innovation comes from and the kinds of change makers that I'm interested in supporting and investing in. I'm proud to say we're just about 50% uh, female founders. And um, yeah, so I mean, as Christine said, I've been working uh, for broad scale, sustainable food system change for a little over 20 years, which I think makes me not as young, but um, anyway, <laughs> uh, happy, happy to be putting all this to work. So I have worked in the social sector. I've worked um, for large scale NGOs and very small grassroots based community organizations, working to help connect farmers with direct marketplaces, advocating um, for global trade agreements. And about five years ago, I recognized that there was a significant um, interest by the investment sector in, in innovative startups. And I was looking at where that capital was going. And for me, um, Danny and I were just chatting about this before we got on stage. I didn't think that where that investment capital was going was going towards solving any real problems that I was interested in investing in. Um, so there's a lot of you know examples of the kinds of companies that I'm not as excited about investing in. But of course, more, more enthusiastic about talking about the <coughs> kinds of companies that are brought driving really broad scale change. Um, so as Christine mentioned, we are an accelerator, a very intentional part of the community that we are intending to build amongst entrepreneurs is very collaborative. We set out to build a very connected ecosystem of support. We are not, there is no winner um, in our accelerator. We don't think that the kind of change that needs to happen on the global marketplace is going to be solved by any single entrepreneur, even in a, in a particular cohort. Um, so that's a bit of how we think and some of the aspects, I would say, of feminine leadership that have nothing to do with being a woman. They're just smart business. Um, I think, as Christine said, all the statistics around how women think, um, how we are able to bring a very differentiated viewpoint in terms of connecting with customers. Um, so that's, that's hopefully a little bit, and we can get into some more as we go. Certainly. Thank you. Uh, Krista, I might just turn to you. And, you know, yours, yours has been a pretty amazing story. So in a relatively short period of time, you've founded a company, uh, Natural Evolution, in 2015. You started off, as I understand it, as a banana farmer and now you're recognised as one of Australia's leaders in the food tech space. So can you tell us a little bit about that kind of transformation? Yeah, absolutely. Um, for us, it was really a do or die situation. Um, we were one of Australia's largest banana growing families. Specifically, we were the largest lady finger growers in, here in Australia. And every week we were dealing with a certain amount of waste of our beautiful produce and, you know, after suffering two devastating Category 5 cyclones, we just went, you know what, there has to be a better way than throwing out all of this glorious produce that we'd put a lot of time, money, energy and love into producing. Simply because there wasn't a market for it, we were throwing it away. And, um, you know, few signs from the universe, I suppose. Um, there is a great TED talk that you can check out about it to get those signs from the universe. But... Um, 
we ended up taking in the bananas and transforming them into a high value return. So we've gone on to now have our powders listed with the Therapeutic Goods Association for various uh, health um, claims. But we've also spread our wings into a lot of other fresh vegetable and fruit processing. And along the way, you know, you can't sit around hand peeling bananas to make a commercial industry out of waste. So we did have to design our own food processing technology, which has gone out and kicked a lot of goals on its own. So really, it was either sit by and watch my family continue to struggle or it was get up and do something. And yeah, that's what I decided to do was get up and do something. <laughs> Great. We'll hear more about what you're doing in a moment. And Danny, um, how about if you could, I'd, I'd like you to ground us, tell us a little bit about your history and story, but ground us in the reality of some of these really big global problems that I know you're addressing at Food Tank. Sure, so uh, again, I'm Danny Nierberg. I'm the founder uh, and president of Food Tank, and we're a research and advocacy organization really dedicated to highlighting stories of hope and success in the food system. And we were founded about six years ago, and the reason we really focus on the success stories and what's working in fields and kitchens and laboratories and town halls and conferences like this one is that you know, there's been so much focus on the problems. When you think about places like Sub-Saharan Africa or the Middle East, you think about conflict and poverty and disease, and you don't think about all the amazing innovators, including you know, thousands and thousands of women who are innovating uh, to help create a, a better food system. Uh, so that's, you know, talk about science from the universe. I was working um, at a, a, an environmental think tank in Washington, D.C. for many years, and it sort of became clear to me that I wasn't going to move from, you know, the position I was in there. It was a little bit of an old boys club. And so, you know, they were really focused on the problems. I wanted to talk about solutions, so that's how Food Tank started. Um, and, and we sort of just took a, took a plunge into the nonprofit and advocacy world. And I think what we try to do that's maybe a little bit different is to create a community and a platform for uncommon collaboration for bringing together people who might not otherwise even you know step in the same room uh, having food justice advocates on the same sort of platform with uh, company executives to have you know tech entrepreneurs learn from uh, you know farmers and fields rather than just you know uh, uh, sort of depending on theory but really talking to one another and I think it's that information sharing that's so critical right now is we, you know, battle some of these most urgent, pressing uh, environmental and social issues. It's not just climate, it's biodiversity, it's women's equality, it's, uh, you know, micronutrient deficiencies. There's a lot to, to handle and struggle with, but I think through collaboration we can really find the solutions. Great. So that's, I think, a really good segue into a question I want to throw to the panel, which is, you know, there's obviously something going on here, but do we actually really think that there are special talents that women bring to the table? Do we think that that is something that we can make a, a, a really definitive contribution? You talked about collaboration. I'm not sure that women do it better. I mean, I think part of the problem is that, and this is, you know, again, what Food Tank tries to do, is that women's voices have been invisible. So whether they're different, I don't think matters. They just haven't been heard or seen in the way that they need to. And I, I you know, I. I, I think there's lots of, of ways to point to what women, you know, do around the environment, but I, I don't know if it's grounded in any scientific theory, you know. Yeah. I've met women who have, you know, been caretakers of seeds for generations in their, you know, it's passed down for generations in their families. I've met women in Iowa who've worked really hard to preserve the land that their grandfathers, you know, started farming on. So maybe they do have a special affinity, but I think what's more important is that they're finally being seen and heard. Mm -hmm. I think if I can jump into it, I think what we're seeing now is if you look at the generations, it's probably a little bit different. So the shift is certainly happening that we see. And I, you know, I guess from my cultural background, I think, you know, where normally the voice of the woman is, you know, the way it comes through and where it's heard at different forums has been probably a little bit suppressed over time. But I think also if you start to see now generations coming through, the younger versions of, of me or others is, I think that's a lot more, you know, it's so 
great to see our innovators who can get up and actually do that. But it's also, I think, and I agree with Danny, I don't think it's because men and women, well, we are different, but I don't think there's anything special. I think it's just allowing the opportunity and to actually have equal voice at the table. So how do we bring that diversity of thought, diversity at each level into it? It doesn't really matter what gender you are at the end of the day, but to have a voice that can be heard and have the courage to actually voice that. I think that's important. Great. Yeah. Rinska, do you have a view? Um, I do, and I, I agree with um, both of you. And I also think that these aspects of feminine leadership, I think about what how important that is around a board table, um, the board roles that I have, I think about what it means to support entrepreneurs as well. Um, and again, it's, it's, it's feminine leadership writ large, doesn't have to be expressed through a female body. But um, for example, we have a part of our curriculum in supporting entrepreneurs that is about their emotional health their physical well-being. Um, it is the first question that I ask any entrepreneur in my portfolio if I get a sense that they aren't taking care of themselves, that they aren't really functioning optimally. Like there, there are aspects and elements that I pay attention to from that kind of standpoint that I think are vital to success. I mean, as any CEO and uh, entrepreneur will tell you, it's a really hard job. It's very taxing, particularly if you are not just building a business, you're trying to change the world at the same time. Um, so I think, again, those are not definitively female, um, but I do think that they are aspects and elements of success that women are now starting to bring into the dialogue and into the discourse. But of course, we would encourage everybody to consider these, mm. these parts as key to success. Ladies, you've nailed it. <laughs> Sorry, Christy, I don't think we could hear you then. You've nailed it. Oh, good. <laughs> Um, I just want to just to turn the conversation a little bit differently now. I think it's important to get some of those, you know, maybe stereotypical views out on the table and whether we believe them or we don't believe them. Um, I like the way you describe it as feminine leadership, Renska, so I think that's a much more helpful way of thinking about it rather than saying only women have these characteristics. But clearly women, um, as they are getting heard, are demonstrating that, they, that the contribution that they're making is delivering results. I want to turn, Danny, you raised when we had a conversation about um, the role of technology, um, and you, you see that technology has that opportunity to really refresh the food system, but that you also kind of offer a bit of a cautionary word about that. Yep. Sure. So, I mean, I, everyone on this panel is, is talking about technology, and I think, you know, it, it's important when we're talking about changing the food system or bettering the food system that there is no silver bullet, as was, was said before, that, you know, we can't look at any innovation or any technology is that's the answer and that's going to solve everything. I think what's happening around the tech sector and and women in agriculture though can be very interesting. I you know when I've traveled in, in sub-Saharan Africa and seen how people are using cell phones and now even smartphones, that can erase some gender barriers when it comes to getting information um, you know f about market prices or weather or financial and banking decisions, that can really maybe make it more equal among men and women because they don't know who's on the other end of that cell phone. Um, there's also sort of some concerns about who's creating the technology. And if technology is created by men, is it going to help serve women farmers to the, the, you know, to the best of its ability? So really sort of looking at it from the creation to the end user and figuring out wh what's going to help all farmers do their jobs better. What do women farmers need in particular from different kinds of innovations and technologies? And then meeting those, those needs. Great. Krista, I wouldn't mind if you just jumped in here. Now, you're, you're a food tech entrepreneur, and I think what's really interesting about your story, if you can just tell people a little bit more about what you're doing in, in relation to technology, because it was a bit unexpected, I suppose, to start with, that that would be where you end up. Yeah, absolutely. So we started out making banana flour, and we were hand-peeling <coughs> bananas in the garage, as you do, and we figured out this stuff is actually really good to bake with, it works really well, but we're a little bit limited in that we're hand peeling bananas. Anyway, we decided to upgrade the facility to the back of the family's cafe. And um, so we were hand peeling them in there, sticking them in food dehydrators. And I'm absolutely certain we were doing our dough. There is no way it was economically viable with us hand peeling 60 to 70 kilos of bananas to make six kilos of banana flour. Anyway, 
the orders started to come in and at the rate we were peeling them, it was going to be at least six months before we'd even caught up. So we really needed that leap, I suppose, to get us from that cottage industry into being able to kind of commercially produce something. Um, and I suppose that's where things work really well in our business. My husband, who is my partner in life and business partner, he is he is he's an innovation genius. You ask him what kind of machine you'd like, he can draw it, design it, build it. Whereas I've got that more people connection, working with people and how it's going to work out the other side of the coin. Um, so he actually designed me a banana peeling machine, which made my life so much easier. I was instantly able to make 350 kilos of banana powder a week. So I was met my orders and we realised that 350 kilos a week really wasn't going to cut the mustard on the global stage. So we did need to come up with that quantum leap in innovation. And what we did was we took a whole processing system where a banana will come in and we now have it down to under 10 minutes, it will be powder in a bag ready to go out the door. And the whole system, we've dubbed it Nutrilock technology because it literally, we've had this scientifically verified, it locks in the nutrition of the product 20 to 50 times higher than conventional food processing techniques. It's been the well-deserved winner of a Gold Edison Innovation Award in New York. And not only are we able to take a banana, peel it, separate the peel from the pulp, mill it and dry it, we're able to take in any fruit or veg and do that as well. In the new year, we're actually going to be releasing our new drying system, which is drying and milling at the same time, and that will automatically double to four times our output. So when you look at drying powders here in Australia at the moment, it costs around $20 to $25 for finished product per kilo. At the most top-heavy, expensive conversion rate, we are $3.80. $3.80 for a finished kilo of powder and it just gets cheaper from that point. The whole system is in line, it's raw. There are literally two people watching the machines work but what we did was write a PLC software system that oversees all of the produce. So the machine, doesn't matter if that farmer's had his irrigation on and he's been irrigating last week, there might be a little bit more water in the product. All the machines automatically adjust to accommodate the seasonal variances and um, obviously with the irrigation and things like that as well. So, I mean, clearly technology is underpinning most of the innovations that are coming through at the moment. And yet, I guess, and I, Caitlin, I'm going to ask you a question in a moment. I'll just give you a little bit of warning there. Um, you know, some of the disturbing statistics about girls not feeling confident going into the engineering, the STEM areas of study. So I'd like, to, I'm going to come to you, Caitlin, in a moment, but Angeline and, and Renska, I mean, are you finding that in either the corporate world or the, where you uh, operate, Renska, that women are less confident or less capable in the technology area? Or are you finding that's changing? Or what's your experience with technology and women coming together? I think um, very early on, it was probably less comfortable, only just because naturally that's not where... Um, girls were going into. Um, having said that, I did study all the STEM, so I'm here. Uh, but I think what I've noticed over the careers and having worked in large multinationals over that time is that there is a lot more comfort level coming in. And I think it's also, um, it's it's a level of interest that I think we need to also nurture and, and be able to guide and coach so that, you know, young Caitlins of the world do pick this topic. But also, I think when you, when you look at food, I think an agriculture one of the things we haven't done really well is we haven't made it sexy like other other you know um, industries. So whether that's medicine or other things, how do we make food and agriculture sexy? Uh, what are all the roles? We actually don't tell the stories. We don't celebrate it enough. And I think that's all of us in this room, right? The fact that we're here, um, and, and I think that will actually be the encouragement of it. So for me, there's a there's a voice as not just females but males and everybody that we have to lean into is how do we celebrate and share a lot of these stories because it's only then that 
the young and the many Caitlins of the world will come in and go, yeah, actually, that looks really cool. I want to go into that. And I think technology at the end of the day is an enabler. And then you look at, you know, there's tech now and look at where AI is coming and in, in, in terms of that. And we are going to, as human to machine, know, you know, learn how to work with that. And I think that's going to really be quite a disruption coming in. But at, at the end of the day, it's still a human to human connection. I'm pretty much down to the simples and the basics. So it doesn't really matter who you are. I think, I think there's an opportunity. Sure. Renska, what are you finding in terms of female entrepreneurs coming through your uh, accelerator? Is there a changing pattern happening here in relation to technology or? I don't, I don't think I would say there's necessarily been a change in the last six years that we've been going um, with Food System 6. I, I think though what is changing, um, and maybe this is happening just because I live in the Bay Area, but food and agriculture is pretty sexy right now. Um, it, it is, you know, definitely meeting, I think, the the interests of a millennial workforce that are really excited about working on something higher purpose. I mean, I think there is, there's an increase of, align, of alignment happening there. Um, so that's not to say that it's an easy path. I have a, a, you know, one female founder who's highly technical, extremely expert in her field, um, but her field is ranching. And it has been definitely a challenge for her um, as, as an Asian female to be navigating what is largely still a male-dominated industry. So it's not to say that I think there's any less interest. I think it's all, you know, what we're talking about here is what are the right support structures and how do, how do you build effective teams um, that can really meet some of these challenges and interests. But I'm excited to hear what Caitlin has to say. Yeah, let's see. Too. So Caitlin, the question for you is, you know, as a young 17-year-old woman, um, you're obviously born into agriculture, as I understand it, so I assume you kind of get that it's a great place to be. But what are you finding amongst your peers? Uh, you know, are some of the issues around is food sexy? Technology, <laughs> do girls do technology? What's your experience? Um, so, yeah, obviously I don't know much about the corporate side of agriculture. Um, so I'm 17, I'm still in school, and the way I got into agriculture was through my granddad's um, beef stud in Gippsland. And um, it's really um, older people like him who have no bias, they have no issues with including women in um, tasks that um, traditionally would be done by men. And it's the people like that we really need to congratulate and um, encourage. And um, uh, at our school, we have a, a, a Corridale sheep stud and we show them at um, national shows and the Melbourne show and um, th generally speaking, there are more girls uh, involved in it in boys. I'm not sure why. <laughs> um, and in terms of, quote, sexiness, um, <laughs> the th one of, like, really specifically speaking, the one of things that we really get out of it is dressing up in our show uniforms and getting out there in our sparkly jeans and our sparkly belt and um, <laughs> it's something that we look forward to every year you know most weekends we're out there doing something um, in that aspect but yeah I think as a young person in agriculture um, especially doing a lot of field work um, the most um, yeah the thing that really att the most attractive thing to agriculture is being out there among the boys and in some instances doing it better than the boys um, and it's kind of a good feeling um, when you're up on stage and um, this year our team from our school of all girls won the National Merino Challenge in Sydney um, which is a lot of wool classing and stuff like that and um, just to be up there competing against some of the best ag colleges in Australia and from our little school um, it's kind of a good feeling and just um, things like that and girls just having confidence to um, explore things that really make them happy is so refreshing and um, yeah. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, so I just want to ask each of the panellists, what's been, do you think, for your own personal journey and your own career, what's been the biggest thing that's helped you achieve what you've been trying to set out to achieve and the successes that you've, uh, you've managed to achieve so far? But before I do that, can I comment yeah, yeah, on something sure, we said? Yeah. I, I'm sorry. Um, so, you know, I, I agree that agriculture is becoming more sexy and more cool, especially in places like the United States and Australia. But I think that we're missing sort of a key part of this, that 
for many countries, including Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia and you know, Latin America, farming is a burden and, and people are trying to get out of it. And so what technology can mm. do, especially for women farmers, is in some cases lessen that burden, create more opportunities for jobs, make it possible for people to stay in their countries rather than wanting to leave or being forced to, to flee. So I think you know we, we have to recognize that farmers are aging all over the world. In the United States, they're over 60 years old. In Sub-Saharan Africa, they're about the same age. We need to create more opportunities for people to be food producers and in creative ways so that it doesn't feel so laborious, that mm -hmm. it it, that they're, they're, the rural places that they live in are engaging and stimulating and they're excited to be there and, and don't feel this need to, to move to the city. And so I feel like technology can have a real role in doing that. And I'm sorry, your question no, was... No, 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 that's all right. <laughs> no, no, you, you obviously uh, picked up something there that you really wanted to... No, no, I was really... I was just leading on from Caitlin's um, story about being herself a role model and I was I was interested in terms of you know when you think over your career what's been some of the really big things that have helped you to succeed what can sure. we learn from that I'll tell you and it, it Renska has been a part of this because she reached out to me you know sort of early in food tanks uh trajectory and having female leaders reach out to me and give advice or say hey do you need someone to talk to do you want you know do you not even sort of offering advice, just saying, hey, do you need, you know, a, a shoulder to cry on sometimes or a helping hand? Having that kind of, of um, collegial atmosphere and collaboration and knowing that there are others out there sort of in your space and then trying to repeat that for others. I mean, Food Tank is mostly made up of, uh, you know, we're a very small and scrappy team, but most of us are women. And, you know, we I try to be a, a good mentor to, to the folks who are interning with me or working for us because I didn't have that always from, um, female leaders because they just weren't there. And so trying to build that sort of collaboration and collegiality, I think is awesome. Yeah, great. Um, totally agree, ditto. And probably two things maybe for me personally has been over my career is actually having role models and mentors um, that I can look up to. And I think I'd really encourage that for everybody. And I have, you know, a number of these role models that, you know, I'd, I'd go in and have a chat with. But again, you know, being able to share, but be able to also share your thinking and how do you sort of build that. So kind of setting up role models. And Christine, you know, you're one of them. <laughs> that I, I ring up every now and then. Um, and I guess probably the second thing is for me also is whenever anyone said to me, that's not ever going to happen or it's impossible. It actually just gave me such inner strength to almost, um, I don't know, maybe be stubborn and bullheaded. That's probably my sign as well. Uh, but uh, to actually just do that, right? Just get on and do that. So um, the fact that you're the, you know, the first female around a board table or that, you know, you're there representing, of course, and then realising that you do carry a weight and a burden and a role model behaviour for others. But how do you really just lean in and do that? And I think over that time, if I look back at role models who are not just male but female and having diversity, I think individually just helps you grow much better into a person and it's a journey at the end of the day right so that's what I'm on <laughs> <laughs> couldn't agree more um, so I'll think of something different to add um, outside of coaching and and great mentors and role models I, I think it's also about your team and it's about who you work with and having a level of awareness about what your strengths are and really looking to build teams that are complementary, um, that can you know, both challenge you and teach you. And so I've obviously had the benefit of some incredible role models and, and mentors along the way and peers and colleagues, um, but really also thinking about what it is. I mean, you're all in different contexts, so it's a little hard to speak more specifically, but just more generally about building that kind of complementary skill set. I think that's, you know, like you talked about your you and your partner and your husband, like two sides of the same coin. I think, you know, really being in a very trusted relationship with somebody who is really thinking very outside of the box that you know, um, who's willing willing to think you know, about how we can leverage different tools to, uh, to achieve mutual goals. So talk about the team. So Krista, you're a woman, you're a farmer, 
you're in a tech industry and you're in a very remote part of Australia. So it must be really easy what you're doing. <laughs> uh, and we had this conversation on the phone. And one thing I'm missing in my life is having a mentor. I mean, um, I actually, I come from a grazing background, so what you ladies would call ranching. And um, it was quite interesting growing up, you know, my dad would take me along and they'd be like, you brought your daughter to do yard work. And, um, you know, even a month ago, I showed up to help him with his muster. So I was part of the str strategy of, we do an annual gathering of the herds, we call it, <coughs> where we bring them all in together. And I was part of that strategy. And you should have seen the look on all the guys' faces when I showed up. They went, oh, what are you going to do? Are you just watching? And I went, oh, no, I'm actually here doing all the gate work. And they, you know, this is 2019. But, you know, I'm grateful for the role models I've had as well. So, you know, my parents have always been, it doesn't matter what anyone says, you just do what you want to do. And I guess I've really adapted to that bulldozer-type behaviour. Nobody gets in my way. And it's about selecting the right people to help you build your road where you want to go. That's been really important. Yeah. And then, you know, now I'm getting a whole lot of other ladies and young girls in my area reaching out to me for support. So that's been a really good thing for me to, to be on the other side of the coin and help them on their path. And um, it's certainly something that I've been working on and am going to start doing more in regional areas. I've got a few more gigs lined up throughout um, regional New South Wales, specifically working with 13 to 17 year olds and helping to build the capacity of their confidence in an agricultural future. Thank you. I'm going to open it up to the audience now for questions and I think we might uh, also have the opportunity for questions through the app, if there's any questions through the app. But I just want to, while you're thinking of your question, um, this just doesn't make sense, does it? I mean, we've got fantastic examples here. The statistics are telling us that women, whether it be in ag or food tech or large corporates, not-for-profits, the commercial sector, investors, we can, we can do this, we can achieve this. So I'm not sure what's going wrong. We know what the solution is. I think you've all reinforced the fact that we know we need good mentors and role models and support and those sorts of things, which is not that hard, really, when you think about it. So my question is what's going wrong, but um, I'll take some questions from the audience, please. Uh, so I've got a comment and a question. Firstly, thank you all for being here. You're all absolute badasses and it was <laughs> a pleasure to hear you talk. Um, my background's in, well, originally animal agriculture. I then went into grain trading and I now help run a vertical farm in Wyoming and we employ, we grow year round and we employ people with different abilities to run our farm in a for-profit model. And um, it is something that's always bothered me that every conference I go to there's a women in ag panel and uh, I just wonder if you feel at all that it's um, sometimes counterproductive you know I'm not suggesting that we're at equality yet you know I know we have a ways to go but I think um, you know to Angeline's comments there is certainly a shift that's taking place and a whole new generation of people in food like Rensker and Danny were talking about and um being 2019 and, and where we are and where we're going, I wonder if you feel that sometimes by focusing on a label and having a women in ag panel instead of a badasses in ag panel, um, that we might be setting ourselves in, in maybe um, a step backwards. You know? um, so we're hot chicks, we're not women in ag. I don't think we see women in ag anywhere. So, but. I, I totally agree with you. I mean, I'm, I, I know the panel's probably... It's not up there. That's what I just wanted the title to be. But, uh, um, when I was approached to actually moderate this panel, I felt really negative about it for the reasons that you've just described. I mean, you know, I'm a bit older than these ladies, and I said, what, are we still in 1979? It's 2019. Uh, but when I did some of the research and also when I heard some of the stories... You know, I don't know. I, I, I honestly don't know the answer to your question. I think we still have to speak out. I think we still have to make these statements. But I agree with you if we feel like this is marginalising us, it's, it's not a good thing to do. So I think it's a really, really important question and I don't think there's an easy answer. I don't know if anybody else... Krista, yeah. I am chomping at the bit to jump in. It's a great question <laughs> and certainly something I thought about as well. I think that 
once we see the statistics start to change, there's not going to be things like this. But the fact is, those statistics are quite frightening, really. And I can give you another wonderful example of interesting behaviour. <laughs> In a couple of weeks, I am launching my new startup business. I'll give it a quick plug, is that all right? That's Plantation fine. Bruco. So we're sustainable, authentically distilled high-end spirits, all made from excess farm produce. We'll be kicking it off with a gold sweet potato vodka. And um, I, it was probably about two months ago now, I had a liquor rep from Melbourne come and visit me up in Walkerman. And I arrived at my factory. I think I probably had some active wear on, two kids in tow, and I've just pulled up at the front door, gone into my office, and he said, so what do you do here? Do you actually do anything? And I just went, oh, here we go, beautiful. I said, no, I just shuffled the papers, but I've got another line that I'll be ready with. I just shuffle the papers with the dollar signs because that's the mentality. This is a liquor representative who works in Melbourne, a metro area all the time, who is hoping to gain my business for distributing my new liquor lines. And that's the mentality I'm getting. And this is 2019, two months ago. So I think that when things like that and the stats go up and women are far more represented, these boards, these panels, it's not going to be there. That's for sure. Any other views? How did you feel coming onto an all-female panel with the title of On the Heels of Innovation? How did you respond? You know, I, I think I'll be so happy when the day comes where I'm not so excited to be on an all-female panel. This is the second one I've been on today. That hardly ever happens to me. I'm usually with a bunch of old white guys. And so, I, you know, I, I get what you're saying and I agree and I want an all-badasses panel and that no one really looks at it and thinks, oh my gosh, there are three women and two men and, you know, the diversity is such and such. I, I just want it to be, like, normal. <laughs> that, and that this is the way farming and and the food system leadership is that you know that mm. women are a part of it it's not unusual but we're not quite there yet even no. though it is 2019 so but i can't wait until that day happens when i'm not so surprised yeah and i think if i can add to it i love the badass title i think i'm going to try and work that into something that i'm going to do in my next two strategy days but um I think also it's, it's not just, I think, it's diversity in its full form, right? I kind of touched on that a little bit earlier on. And when you kind of look at this and in Australia today, sorry for our American friends, but if we sit in Australia today and you look at it, our population is changing. I mean, look at migration, look at all of that. But when you look at, you know, whether we're around a board table or around a panel session and you look at, are we really bringing diversity of thought into it? So that's young, old, that's, you know, Anglo, Asian, that's male, female, it's every kind of thinking. And I think, yeah, we need to bring that full diversity of thinking, only then do we actually move forward as a community and as a society. And I think, um, you know, the stats are alarming. And I know, I mean, we all sit there, even Christine and I are going, you know, what, you know this is the second panel that I'm doing as well. And, uh, and while it's great, and even as a speaker, I always want to never be the token female on a panel. And that's a rule that I said, right? Sometimes you get excited because someone's asked you to speak, but it's like, hang on, who else is there? And it's a no, but you know, they're the small steps that you can take, but I think eventually, I think it starts with all of us and the unconscious bias that we bring in. Unfortunately, that's become as a result of the experiences that we have or the education that we've had and how do we unlock that? I think only then do we move forward. Caitlin, would you like to yeah. speak? Um, yeah. Um, obviously, I haven't been um, involved in the kind of agriculture you have been involved in, but for me, as a young person, I was actually really excited to be um, uh, talking at this specific topic because, um, obviously, for young people, especially young girls, to see women like you up here and, and just leaders... Um, in the sector, like I met the Minister of Agriculture before and I thought it was amazing that she was a woman. Um, I think it's good to have that inspiration and um, see what your future could look like. Um, but I agree, I, I look forward to a future where I can 
hopefully be an agricultural leader and not be just a diversity quota, not be um, just the token female speaker. And um, the day when people look at ability before gender, um, which we're getting there, definitely. But, um, yeah, like you said before, I don't think we're there yet. Like, men have been the leaders of agriculture for hundreds of years and women have only really had this short burst where they can really, really step up um, and um, confidently, you know, be a leader. And, um, yeah, I think we still have a long way to go before it's really integrated. So, yeah. Great. Thank you. Do we have another question? Christine, awesome. um, so um, just before, I've got a question on the app here, but just as a comment, um, the panels that I've uh, been involved with today, the moderation, uh, probably overrepresented by women and some amazing content. And so I think the role modelling probably comes from males as much as females uh, and the modelling about, you know, what treating, you know, on an equal footing. Um, and so no greater example of that than the teen innovators, which gives me a lot of hope. Uh, Sophie over here at the end uh, did an amazing job, Caitlin on stage, and we've actually got another question from another one just here. Um, hi, my name's Erin. Um, I obviously know what it's like to be the only girl in a room when it comes to agriculture. I'm wondering what you guys would think um, the, ne the battle is to, to fight this mentality of um, what is this woman doing here? How do we stop that? What is the next step that you want to see of bringing up more women into, into the field? What do you um, think the next step towards that is? Great question. <laughs> well, just one. like I don't think there's a single bullet technology answer to some of the challenges we face in our food system, I don't think, unfortunately, there's an easy answer or a single answer. Uh, winning is one answer. Um, just doing it, just just getting out there, you know, doing whatever it is that you think needs to be done, knowing that there are people who want to hear that voice, who need to hear that voice, and, and not letting anything stop you, um, even though there will be forces that will try to stop you, and they won't all be male, there's no question. It's, it's hard. Um, but I do think that, you know, just setting your path and knowing that there's going to be knocks, but getting yourself back up and knowing, again, there are people that want to hear your voice and need to hear your voice and that that's going to change the world um, is, is winning. So that's one thing. Hi. Stick with the bulldozer mentality. Just keep going. You're building a road and then they'll follow behind you. Hi, I'm Sam Nowland. Um, I'm just wondering from each of you if you've had children or not and if that's impacted or not impacted your careers in agriculture. <laughs> Is this where I tell you I took the laptop to the hospital and the nurses were <laughs> horrified? And I said, Laura, look, so this was when we were just starting up. It was in 2015. And I said, well, like someone's got to send the invoices. So if I don't send the invoices, may as well shut the business down. And that's just how I roll. You know what? I think I've got better since I had kids. Really? Like... There was a whole window of opportunity there from 1 a.m. to 3 a.m. <laughs> to send emails. No. Um, you, just, you just make it work. That's the thing. It's that undying want to win and succeed and get there and evolve and grow. You just make it work. And then all of a sudden, you know, yes, you have children, but there's a little bit more motivation for you too to be a good leader and great example to them. And I'm, I feel super blessed. I've got two young daughters growing up in our evolving ag tech, ag food space at home. So two great workers coming up the ranks. <laughs> <laughs> Slaves. <laughs> Does anyone else want to comment on that question? No. Nope. I mean, yes, I'll, I'll say I have two young daughters as well. And for me, and, you know, they're, they're all the reason that I do what I do. I mean, we're, we're working on trying to tackle some of the biggest challenges as far as human health, environmental health, social health, social justice. Like, I can think of no better reason than, you know, the world that I want my children to inherit. Um, so, yeah, you, you do it. I mean, yeah, you're, we're multitasking all the time. Um, and it's not easy, but it's, it's motivating for sure. So I, I'm not a, a real mom. I'm a stepmom sort of recently. And, you know, two, two boys, right? And what my husband said to 
I mean, I'm like cheering up a little bit. On our wedding night, he said, you know, I'm so proud that you can be an example for these boys, that, you know, my sons. And I think that's important, that we're not only talking about being an example for young women, but being an example for young men and boys and making sure that they understand that women are leaders and, and can be, you know, uh, uh, honored and, and, and thought of in, in, as heroes and heroines in different ways. So I just think that's an important part of this, realizing that this isn't just about women, it's about all of us. So I have four children, two real children and two stepchildren, <laughs> if that's the definition. <laughs> So I'm a real mum and a not real mum. I'm not quite sure how that works. And I'm also a grandmother, so I have seven grandchildren. Um, and I have four companies. And um, I, I see that, you know, I agree with what you've said. You know, there's nothing better that you can do for children is to, is to create a world where food and the environment and all these things that we know are so important um, are well looked after. And if we feel that we have to be the voice for that, then let's be the voice for that. Um, I always say, the other thing I wanted to say too is that I strongly believe in teaching your children how to become entrepreneurs. Don't teach them how to get a job. Teach them how to change the world. And I'm not going to embarrass you, her, but my daughter is actually in this room. And I'm so proud she's joined my company. Any other questions? Yeah, um, just want to ask a question on behalf of my wife. She can't be here today. So she was recently at an event, agricultural event, and um, was surrounded by a lot of older gentlemen in our industry. And she, I would not use the word politely, but she got torn down for being a female in that industry, in a public environment. In her mind, she wanted to reach through his throat and rip it out because it was really insulting. But I guess, in, in, you guys are all leaders in your field. If you're approached in that manner and, and in a public forum, how would you deal with it <laughs> in a diplomatic way without... I guess taking the high road, I guess it's probably the right way of doing it, but to get your message across that she is a genuine person in that industry that, for me, I'm proud of her, what she's done. She is leading the way for females in our industry and I just wanted, I wanted to be there to slap this guy in the face myself as being a husband. But I guess from your, your point of view, what would you have done? It's a great question. I'm the least likely person to give a diplomatic answer, so... <laughs> I kind of know, and those people who know me in the room know how I would have responded, but I don't know, how, how do we respond to that kind of behaviour? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I've experienced um, firsthand people, not just men, but also women that come up to you and say that might not be involved in ag, and they say, what ag, isn't that just like driving tractors and stuff? And, you know, and I'm like, no, there are so many things you can do. And even the um, perhaps traditionally male areas of ag are easily um, achievable um, with women and to, I guess, overcome, I guess, discrimination or um, things that really get you down, I think it was um, Renska that said before, um, you win. <laughs> like, exactly, yeah. You go there and you don't let people tell you, get, get into your head and, and let people tell you that just because of your gender, um, you, you're, you haven't got the same qualifications or abilities to do what um, a man does. And um, it feels, <laughs> it sounds really pretentious, but it feels really good to win um, around, I guess, old white dudes because um, <laughs> in in what I'm involved in, so um, the sheep industry and, um, and showing and, and um, going up against studs that have been around for like hundreds of years... Um, uh, it's yeah. It's you just have to really go out there and be confident in what you know and um, what um, you want to pursue. And if you stop and if you let people get into your head and get you down, then you're just becoming what they want you to become, and that's really disheartening. Um, but yeah, just an example of that is the the president of our breed society is a woman, and she's probably oh, the biggest role model ever ever because she is surrounded by men and she. At, will, will stop at nothing to, I guess, do what she wants and do what's right. And um, to have people like that is really encouraging. So, yes. I think Renska made a really great point before, though, that it's really important, you know, those things really hurt. 
And so, you know, making sure that there is that support network around you um, and, you know, you're obviously supporting your wife as well. So, you know, checking in with the people that you know that their emotional well-being and their, you know, that they're feeling good, they're feeling supported is, is really one of the most important things I think you can do. I think I know who your wife is now. I've just It's just clicked. She's probably a little bit like me because in Queensland we don't quite have that mentoring structure in ag that I've seen in other parts of Australia. So certainly I think, you know, mentoring and, and just having that friend in ag that you can ring up and say, oh, you know, like the girls catching up at the coffee shop, we can catch up on the phone. Hey, guess what happened this week? And, you know, just getting past it so that if it does happen again, you're ready for it. Last one. I was just going to add in two points. I guess you can take two parts, right? You can stand there and give it back as much as, uh, you know, he gave back to your wife. Uh, or you can, you know, be diplomatic and not say anything. But I think the other thing is, is um, if I just go back to the gender piece, is, as women, if we, if, you know, if that happened to me, I would also carry a burden on what does that mean to the wider gender, if you will, right? So if I went quiet, then hang on, my voice is not being heard and therefore, what am I doing? So I guess it's an encouragement. But the, but the other thing is, is I think sometimes you're just gonna have to play the game the way the game is being played. So I think we're out of time, so thank you so much. And if I could ask you to thank this amazing panel of women who are working and getting the job done. Thank you very much.